Hi everybody, welcome to the session. I'm Wendy Gers, I'm an international curator, researcher and consultant, and I'm here tonight to talk to you um, on this very special program. I'm really excited to be here tonight and thank Joshua for this invitation to be here with you. In addition to being an international curator, I run residency programs in the south of France and Saint Raphael, and um, I work with artists as a coach and a mentor online um, to help them develop their practices, which is what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. The subject of my presentation is how to evaluate your artwork. And what I'm going to be presenting tonight is not a critique or formal analysis that one would have learned at high school or in the beginning of an art school program. I'm not going to be telling you how to look and describe an artwork or make an inventory of the key motifs and elements, how to determine content, to understand creation processes, understand those relationships, as well as figure out the meaning of your artwork. That's something that you should be able to do by yourself as a professional artist. Evaluating your artwork means different things to different people. And tonight, I'm not going to be presenting tools or techniques for determining the sales price or the market value of your work. If you wish, in question time, we can touch on this matter. So, why do you need to evaluate your artwork? Well, how seriously do you take your art career? Do you want to gain an international visibility? And do you really want to receive critical attention from the people that matter the most, from scholars, the press, curators, international residency programs, connoisseurs, collectors, non-profits, funding bodies, museums and heritage organizations? So who the heck am I to talk about this? How am I qualified to speak about this subject? Well, I have a PhD in art history focusing on research and curating in contemporary ceramics. Over the past 25 years, I've worked in museums on three continents and I've taught at universities around the globe. I established a research laboratory for graduate and postgraduate students at the École Nationale Supérieure d'Art in Limoges that focused on ceramics and new technologies. I've lectured and delivered keynote addresses in over 20 countries in Asia, Europe, Africa, the Middle East and Australia, as well as the United States. I've published extensively both books, journal articles, as well as public facing texts. And I sit on various boards on ceramic organizations across the globe. Finally, and last but not least, I'm a member of the Academy, the International Academy of Ceramics. On this slide, one can see a handful of international universities. These are among the institutions that I've delivered lectures, workshops and other addresses in the last couple of years. This slide shows a variety of art museums and galleries around the world with which I've had the fortune and great privilege of collaborating. The top ones are where I've curated major exhibitions. The Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Art Museum is where I started my career as a young curator and I had the great privilege of working five years in this institution. My next big gig was the Inga Museum in Taipei where I curated the Taiwan Ceramics Biennale in 2014 and the Henan Museum in 2016 where I curated the First Central China Ceramics Biennale. I've had the great privilege of working in the Middle East, in Europe, as well as Asia and Africa over the past 25 years, collaborating with museums on different exhibition and research projects, as well as conferences, etc. And here's some organizations that I've collaborated with over the years. Um, in many instances, I've delivered lectures and keynote addresses at these organizations. So before we go on to discuss evaluating your artwork, I'd like to take you on a very brief walkabout of a couple of the major installations of the first Central China International Ceramics Biennale that I curated in China. 
The reason for this little mini walkabout of a couple of works is to give you a sense of what I as an international curator look for when I choose artists to work with um, for a very big project like an international exhibition or Biennale. What is a Biennale, you may well be asking. Well, it's a major exhibition that happens every two years, and it's usually part of local and regional governments' tourist programs. It also serves to valorise a local cultural and artistic heritage and draw attention to important sites and programs of the country. A curator is usually appointed two years before the opening event, and that curator is a glorified project manager stringing together teams of disparate people, artists, museum people, as well as the press. On any given Biennale, one manages um, up to 65 artists, usually from 30 countries, involves speaking many languages, working with translators, and working across many time zones. The budget of these events are not shy of a million US dollars, um, and one has to obviously be very responsible when managing uh, a project of this scope. The opening is usually accompanied by um, a very special ceremony as well as cultural tours. And one of my big, biggest jobs is writing a catalog or a series of catalogs, handbooks, etc., as well as wall panels, texts, and press releases that accompany the Biennale. So, the first artist I'm going to mention is Walter McConnell, who was an artist in residence who I invited to join us in China. And he made this very large installation uh, with six of these uh, tented domes uh, in, with raw clay installations inside. The next artist that I worked very closely with was Yang Zhejiang, uh, a Chinese national who does uh, develop this amazing body of work using ceramic filters that had been rejected um, and were damaged. So she recycled uh, industrial filters that were destined for use in cars and other heavy industry, um, creating this very beautiful landscape um, called San Shui um, with industrial urban environments in the front and nostalgic um, reflection on the natural environment mountainscapes in the background. This poetic installation is by Tanya Smets, a Dutch artist who I invited to be an artist in resident. She worked in a porcelain factory with workers who are specialized in making porcelain flowers, notably chrysanthemums and peonies. She worked with them to develop this very uh, amazing white landscape featuring chrysanthemums as well as industrial waste, cable ties and uh, felt offcuts. In this slide you see um, a sculpture by Osamu Kajima, a Japanese national who lives and works in Taiwan at the moment. Um, he works with traditional Taiwanese roof tiles, which he amasses and creates these incredible uh, sculptures with. In the background, you'll see a work by Cheryl Thomas, um, an American artist who makes these really impressive uh, diode series, which look like a collapsed textile. Vipu Srivlasa, the Thai-born Australian artist, was also an artist in residence. He worked at the Hanan Museum and developed this incredible project, Who Will Save the Earth? He collaborated with school children um, from indigenous communities in Australia and uh, in Torres Strait, and as well as the Torres Strait Island uh, community. Jonathan Keep, uh, one of the world leading 3D printers who works with natural code and developed these series called Langton's Ant series and um, his I and the Ant Hills above. Next up, we have Kim Jury, a Korean artist who was also an artist in residence. She undertook a research project into disappearing architectural heritage 
and created the most uh, amazing reproduction of a Qin Dynasty mansion a complex. And um, as with all her works, these raw clay architectural models are placed in a tray of water and they disappear very slowly. Yulan van der Wiel, another Dutch citizen and artist in residence in this project, developed a series of work using his magnetic clay techniques. This specific body was developed at a local Chinese factory using molds from the 80s that themselves reflect historic vessels from the central China region. Remember Jonah, a multimedia installation by the young Nigerian artist Ngozi Azema was one of the most exciting pieces on the show and measured approximately four meters in height and four meters in width. Another African artist, Catherine Glende, created this multimedia sound installation composed of ceramic vessels and rocks. She accompanied it with a sound piece made with rocks and her vessels, um, working with professional musicians and uh, recording that. Geng Su, a Chinese artist, very young filmmaker, showed pieces from her film Origin Tracking um, in a very exciting installation of a very unique work. Ines Lavia, a young French artist, has been making really exciting work um, with ceramics and glass, and um, I was very honored to include her. She was perhaps one of the youngest artists on the Biennale, um, probably around 20 years old. In this slide and in previous examples that you've seen, you've noted that there's a very, very wide variety of practices that have been incorporated in this Biennale. I'm interested in clay as a very expanded field, and Practices such as performance, painting, photography, dance, are all incorporated into my practice as a curator. In this slide, we see one of the most exciting um, and risky political works on the Biennale. Shlomit Bauman collaborated with Abid al Jarabari, a traditional Palestinian potter and created this work about the impossibility of developing a national heritage and the impossibility of dialogue within contemporary Israel and Palestine. Wan Lea developed this wonderful work about um, earthquakes within China using K-line readings to map the last five major earthquakes in China. Finally, Lu Bin uh, did a wonderful series of exciting ephemeral works that disintegrated during the Biennale and spoke about disappearing Chinese heritage, um, particularly related to Buddhist culture um, within China. Okay, so moving on rapidly. Now that we've got a sense of the size and the scale and the scope of a couple of works from, this, from my last Biennale, let's talk about how to evaluate your artwork. So how do we do that? Well, I've developed five key criteria for the evaluation of your artwork, and we'll discuss those briefly as we continue. Ambition is one of the key criteria to evaluating your artwork. And here I define an ambitious artist as somebody who's striving to reach a goal or achieve artistic distinction through hard work, dedication, and perseverance. An ambitious artist takes risks and their work inspires all. How do they achieve this? Well, through sustained, technically and conceptually audacious work, perhaps through interconnected series. Often artists think it's necessary to scale up. This is not the case, however, and I believe that artists can make small works and interconnected series that are technically ambitious and challenging. The second criterion for evaluating your artwork is excellence. An artwork should be fit for purpose in terms of form, that's its design, in terms of content as well as concept, 
And here I'm going to be very controversial and stick my neck out and say that I do embrace sloppy craft or badly made ceramics. And here's the caveat. The caveat is I embrace it if and only if expressive materiality is the express intention of the artist and that badly made work is not a result of a lack of skills, but rather the intention. The third concept I'd like to discuss tonight is innovation. This is a slightly complex concept and um, I've provided a definition. So innovation is the result of a process that brings together novel ideas, creative thoughts and new imagination in the form of a new artwork. And what I'm going to do is just highlight this notion of process, which is really important. It doesn't happen overnight. One brings together ideas, thoughts and imagination over a long term period and it's an evolution and this is um, what I really like to see in an artist is this idea of innovation and evolution. The fourth criterion is originality and obviously this is key. The first sub-definition, the quality or state of being original, refers to the bigger picture. How can you determine if a work is original? Our ceramic history is over 200,000 years old. Where do you place yourself on that timeline? The second aspect is the question of freshness, design and style. Thirdly, in terms of originality, one needs to think about the power of independent thought or constructive imagination. Lastly, but definitely not least, is you, you the artist. Do you have an artistic voice and language that reflects you and your unique, your original interests? And this is really important. There's so much bland art out, art out there. What one needs to be seen and heard is a language that is unique and that is yours. Okay, so there you have it. The five keys to evaluating your artwork. And by pure chance and coincidence, they also form the acronym AEIOU. I really like the serendipity of uh, this acronym because the vowels, A-E-I-O-U, are the basis to language and I think it's uh, also the basis to, uh, well, the fundamentals really of a successful art practice. And when you look at those five, you can see I've put a bracket around the central three, excellence, innovation and originality. Um, and I believe that those can only be manifested by undertaking serious long term research um, and being able to critically locate your artwork within the broader body of art history and specifically ceramics history, but not only. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to be insisting on the importance of research by looking at inspiring moments from ceramic world history. The first item you see on your left, the reconstructed vessel, contains fragments of the world's oldest pottery. It comes from China's Hunan province, and these fragments are believed to be between 15 and 18,000 years old. The second image, the small black Venus, is from Dolny Vestanis in the Czech Republic. The figure is really unique, as you can see, it's made from a mixture of clay and ground bone that gives this, this beautiful, soft, shiny figure finish. Figures from this cave are believed to be between 27 and 31,000 years old, and similarly curvaceous counterparts have been found across Europe and Asia Minor at Upper Paleolithic sites. The central figure which you may recognize are vessels from ancient Japan from the Jomon period. There are approximately 80 sites in Japan where Jomon pottery vessels have been found, and they are generally accepted to be the oldest pottery in Japan 
dating from between 14,500 and 300 BCE. The final image that are on the right um, comes from the Nile Valley. It depicts ungulates, which are this antelope on the top figure, the top vase, um, the top view, which, um, and on the bottom view, we see boats with human figures. While pottery from the Nile Delta dates back to as far as 8000 BCE, this specific vessel dates from 3000 to 3300 um, BCE. Fast forward a couple of thousand years, and I wish to present the history of clan performance. On your left is Kazuo Shiraga performing Challenging Mud by writhing and wrestling in a pile of mud at the first Gutai exhibition in Tokyo in 1955. His barefoot action performances indelibly extended the notion of painting. The second image in your center is called a Direction for a Cloud Crowd, and it was a collaborative performance performed by the artists Anne Walsh, Jim Melchett, and Michael Swain in 1972. Beginning with the assertion that life is divided between things that are given and things that are taken, the artists give and take instructions throughout this performance, prompting further actions and interactions from one another and between each other and the audience. The final image is Johan Tom's 2008 performance, also entitled Challenging Mud, after Kazuo Shiraga. In this performance, the artist covered his entire body with honey and gold leaf for a private performance in which he was buried alive by his wife and a group of close friends. This work is strangely hypnotic with a repetitive sound and motion of the spade and roid soil, creating a meditative viewing experience. These works by Yan Zhang from China are there for all the skeptics out there who say, there's nothing new to do, it's all been done before. Well, I beg to differ. Vessels are perhaps the most challenging area for radical innovation. And look what Yan Zhang has done in recent years. The images on your left recall poignant anthropometric forms of humans and animals in very cheeky and clever ways. The second slide depicts body of work that literally refers to the relationship of the body vessel and its creator, the mold. It evokes questions of molding as a metaphor for control and creation. Very, very powerful works within the context of contemporary China. So how does one go about developing one's research? Well, reading. And readers are leaders. I want to point to the plate there with the crumbs and just emphasize the fact that what you're getting on your social media feeds and Google searches are merely crumbs. Academics, researchers, scholars simply can't put all their material out there. They have to earn a living, they have to publish, and there are economic realities to what is available out there on the net. It's not everything and it's very, very biased and very, very superficial. You are really just consuming the very, very, very leftover crumbs that are there to entice you on social media and via your Instagram feeds. I also want to emphasize that our ceramic culture and our ceramic history is extremely deep and varied. There probably isn't a continent, a country or a region which hasn't engaged with clay and ceramics. And so we have this incredible heritage and I encourage you all to tap into it, to read, to learn more and to advance your practice in this way. The next slide depicts the Ganges Delta in Bangladesh. And what am I about here? Well, you can see that tiny little arrow. It points to a little creek and that creek 
gets bigger and bigger and wider and eventually it makes its way into this incredible delta. The metaphor here is ceramics. Ceramics is part of a bigger global art scene and one can choose where one wants to place the cursor. One can live in a little rivulet in an eddy in the middle of nowhere and practice your art uninformed and unconnected with the rest of the world. But that is very delusional. We're all connected in these very intricate ecosystems. And what, up, what happens upriver does affect what happens downriver. And likewise, what happens downriver affects upriver. So in terms of developing your practice, do so from a place of knowledge and understand where you are in the big picture. Are you on a tiny little rivulet, a little stream, a creek in the middle of nowhere? Or are you in the sea embracing contemporary art and design practices um, with great gusto? So there you have it. Ceramic Residency's unique formula to evaluating your artwork. A, E, I, O, and you. This insider knowledge is the result of 25 years of teaching and international curating. Adopting this framework is paramount to developing a successful practice from a position of clarity, knowledge, and confidence. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of rigorous, deep research in this process. I also recommend that you find mentors and coaches to guide you to keep you focused and ensure that you are on track. Families and loved ones are not suitable candidates for this job as they simply don't have the necessary professional skills or insider knowledge. You need to invest time and money in developing your practice in these challenging times where old modes of operating are no longer sufficient. If you want to know more about our group and individual coaching and mentoring services, please head over to the Ceramic Residency Virtual Booth here in the Ceramics Congress to learn more. Thanks folks for your time and interest. I hope you've learned from this presentation and that you'll benefit from this insider knowledge. Please don't be shy to ask questions in the Q&A session afterwards. I love helping artists and look forward to hearing from you. If you found this useful or interesting, please head over to our website and to the booth to learn more about our transformational coaching and mentoring programs, our retreats and residencies in scenic Saint Raphael on the French Riviera, which will be starting up again in September. I offer artists numerous free coaching tools, as well as other inspirational art resources for free when you sign up for our newsletter. So let's stay in touch and let's move forwards together. Now, let's go out in style with a blast from the past that will help you remember the Ceramic Residency acronym A-E-I-O-U. So it's time for freeze. From 1983, take it away.